Herzlich willkommen. Benvenuti ist der Sera Frankfurter Kunstverein. Let me make an investigation now. Who is Italian speaking here? Ah, okay. Just a, just a couple of non-Italian speakers. Allora mi viene da darle il benvenuto in italiano al Frankfurt Kunstverein. Mi chiamo Francisca Nori, sono la direttrice di questo posto, ben lieta di accogliere, occhio al feedback, al di ritorno, ehm, di accogliere non solo eh, la, il secondo appuntamento in cooperazione con il Consolato Italiano, per cui ringrazio il Console, ma anche Michele, diventato un caro collega in questi preparativi, ma stasera i nostri due discotanti, Paolo Ferri che parlerà con Telmo Pievani, due miti diciamo nella riflessione, de... beh no tutti e due, devo vedere di non entrare nel, nel raggio della, del feedback, perché? Perché ci fanno riflettere grazie a delle nozioni scientifiche a delle questioni che invece hanno una forte influenza proprio sul nostro pensiero attuale su quale direzione la nostra società prenderà da adesso in avanti, visto alle urgenze che ci hanno posto i cambiamenti che noi infliggiamo al pianeta. Per cui interessantissimo dibattito, vi auguro buona, buon ascolto, abbiamo anche dopo un momento di interventi in dialogo con i due discutanti, Q&A, e magari diamo anche già l'anteprima la, per l'appuntamento del 16, anche questo in cooperazione con il Consolato Italiano, ma magari lascio a lei il racconto. Allora, benvenuti. Sì. Grazie. Innanzitutto vorrei ringraziare Franziska Nori e la Frankfurter Kunstverein per ospitarci in questa bellissima sala, luminosa, interessante, con un affaccio sul centro di Francoforte, siamo nel cuore di Francoforte, ancora grazie per questa eh, squisita e bellissima collaborazione. Eh, questo è l'ultimo incontro del ciclo Un mondo di libri, Italien eine Bücher Welt, che il Consolato Generale ha concepito eh, anche come eh, cammino preparatorio eh, alla Fiera del Libro 2024, quando l'Italia sarà paese ospite d'onore qui a Francoforte. I will say it also in English for our friends and guests who don't speak Italian. We are organizing this series of um, events, uh, book presentations, also uh, as a path leading to the Frankfurter Buchmesse, the book fair in Frankfurt, next year when Italy will be uh, the guest of honor. Questa sera abbiamo il professor Telmo Pievani, che ringrazio, che è venuto dall'Italia e ehm, insieme a Paolo Ferri vi sarà una discussione dal titolo La natura è più grande di noi, nature is bigger than us. E penso che gli ultimi eventi, eh, cito soltanto le alluvioni in Emilia Romagna, dimostrano come veramente la natura sia, penso, non soltanto più grande di noi ma anche più potente dell'uomo e l'uomo debba riflettere con, con grande attenzione e cura all'interazione che c'è fra il nostro agire e la natura. So this I think is a very uh, important topic to discuss the interaction between uh, humankind, our actions and the planet, the earth and the environment and i look forward to uh, the discussions with uh, Telmo Pievani, Paolo Ferri and with you. Una breve introduzione del professor Pievani che ringrazio ancora. Uh, Telmo Pievani insegna filosofia delle scienze biologiche all'Università di Padova e direttore di Picaia, il portale italiano dell'evoluzione e collabora con il Corriere della Sera che è uno dei più importanti se non il maggior eh, quotidiano italiano e con altre importanti riviste, riviste come Le Scienze e Micromega e numerosi sono stati i suoi libri che hanno avuto anche una grande diffusione. Professor Telmo Pievani uh, teaches philosophy of biological sciences at the University of Padua. He's the director of PICAIA, the Italian web portal on evolution, and collaborates with Corriere della Sera 
maybe the, may, the biggest or most important uh, newspaper in Italy, Le Scienze and Micromega. And he published a series of important books and is also very active on, on TV, if I may say. Io mi interro interrompo qui e lascio la parola al, al dottor Paolo Ferri. Grazie. In English, eh, Michele? <laughs> so, good evening, uh, also from my side. Uh, it was uh, for me a, a, bit, a bit of a surprise to be invited to talk to Professor Piavani, but uh, also a, a big honor, but also a big pleasure because uh, it gave me the opportunity, first of all, to read very thoroughly this book, which was uh, from the first page, it was a pleasure. And secondly, also to ask him questions. And I think you have to take also this opportunity today because uh, it doesn't happen every day that you can ask questions to Professor Piavani. Um, I want to start with just a few words on the book because uh, uh, it's important to understand also the discussion that we're going to have. Um, the book is based <coughs> on a collection of articles on the Corriere della Sera, indeed, uh, plus some considerations that you have added, which I find uh, exceptional as well. Um, and the nice thing about the book, the, the articles talk about a large variety of subjects, but this aspect, well, nature, but in particular our relation with environment, the relation between the human species and the environment is really the, um, the, the main subject of the book. But another characteristic is that the majority of these articles, I guess, have been written during the pandemics. And the book doesn't talk about the pandemics, but it is permeated by it. And in fact, while we will talk tonight about evolution and the environment and our relation to the environment and climate, you know, all these subjects which you will find explained and discussed in the book, I think the w one important uh, uh, lesson out of this book is also how you teach, um, wh how you communicate science. And we have a master here, and at the end of the book, he puts 10 mistakes that you should not make in communicating science. And I think it's a decalogue that I, I really appreciate it very much. And um, maybe we, we will come to that towards the end. And I apologize, I had to write my questions because I, I didn't have the book in paper. I had it on uh, an electronic version, so I couldn't take notes there. Yeah? So, and by the way, I had to translate the, the quotes because I read the book in Italian and then I had to translate in English. So you tell me whether the quotes are correct or not. Um, and I start with one point which actually is tackled in the first chapter. I, uh, you start with uh, giving some numbers which are impressive about the human impact on nature. Yeah? Like Janet is either a lunatic or an economist. And uh, I like this, and it, this quote because it actually leads to uh, a question that I have. We discuss it also with my wife uh, frequently. In a world that is dominated by economic interest, whatever lesson we learn, is there a way that we can apply this lesson to live in a, in a more harmonic uh, relationship with nature? Uh Thank you so much for this occasion. Thank you, Paolo, and, and to you all for this invitation, for inviting me here for this occasion. Let me say, and it's true, it's quite strange for me to be on this stage because I would like to, to ask many questions to Paolo for, for his work on Rosetta and many other research. So it, it's great. It's, it's a real pleasure. And, and thank you for reading the book and, and for, for your questions. And the first one is, is very hard since the beginning because I think that we have reasons for hope, but but it we have also to be realistic in order to understand what we are what is it, it's happening. Uh, the latest uh, data that we have from the IPCC, for example, are very worrying, and we have to share this data. Okay, according to the IPCC, from here to 2030, so the the magical year of the agenda or the European agenda, that is after tomorrow. Uh, the the average degree of the global temperature will be 1.5. So we we are in the future. So we discussed for half a century about about that, and now it's happening. And what is very worrying for us, we study models, even in Padua and with many others, we study 
modelization also of the relationship between man and, and environment and climate. When we will arrive to 1.5, we know very well that uh, we will see what we call tipping points. So it's a process of acceleration of the interactions between humans and environment. And tipping points mean that you have uh, and human action, for example, on the highs or on forest, and this creates a positive feedback loop in order to accelerate the process. So we are in a, we have a problem, okay, and now it's approaching. Reasons for hope for me are of two kinds. One is the, um, let me say this way, the very strange convergence that we see today uh, among very different languages. For example, now we have people, uh, young movement in Germany, in Europe, in Italy, like Friday for Future, Extinction Rebellion, or uh, what else? And what is incredible for me, if you listen to their reasons, they are saying, please listen to science. Please read nature and science. It's the first time for me that something like a revolutionary young movement has his, its reason in read science. So we have this conversion between science and movement of, of young people, like my, my daughter, for example. Uh, we have a conversion between science and the Pope Francis uh, uh, approach to deep ecology. Uh, and and it's, it's incredible for me. If you look at the natural science or Lancet, in the in the last in, in the past three day three years, you find papers that are that have a language that is very similar to the language of the environmental movements like WWF and 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 Greenpeace ten and twenty years ago. So it's a com it's a strange and and unique convergence from many directions, saying that we have a problem. But I think that we will have conflicts. It will be uh, a very um, hard transition because we have, as you said, very strong uh, economic interest. We have this process. In in my book, I talk about science communication and also in science and society. I don't know in Germany, but in Italy today, you cannot find uh, denialist like in the past. People say no, uh, it's impossible that climate change has an anthropic reason. But the same denialists now are becoming people uh, inventing some strange arguments that are trying to confuse the debate in Italy about ecological and, and technological transition. So we have to be very careful and it will be hard because it's a, it's a fight between different interests. And the main fight, the two main fights that we have to consider are from the global south towards our positions. I I came in April in Chile, for example, and, and another in another time in Africa, and it's incredible because if you if you see the approach of scientists in South America and in Africa, now they are saying, okay, the problem is the Euro American science. You are the reason of this problem. Now we, the global south, we will find the solution. And this is not good for me because it's a conflict even between science from different parts of the world. So, so we have to listen to this reason from the global south. And the other great conflict between interests it, it, it's the, is the intergenerational conflict between my generation, our generation, and young generation. There is an objective conflict of interest. So there are reasons for hope in our young, in, in, in the young minds of our songs. Thank you. I think it, what you quoted these two points, which are definitely very important. Uh, science getting into this, uh, into the talks of young people, sci of those who protest in the street. And uh, science, in the words of the Pope, this is quite, quite new, yeah? Uh, uh, I think since uh, Galileo, we know normally the th two things don't go very close together. But um, still the economic interests are driven by other people. So again, I don't want to be too pessimistic, yeah? but uh, can you see how, how can we influence that? I, I just quote something I heard this morning that um, there are 50 nations who are in favor. Uh, oh, what was it? Was it's related to, the, um, uh, to plastic. 
are in favor of a treaty to abolish or to control plastic, but a number of nations are against. And these nations are the usual ones, China, United States, uh, Arabic nations, and so on. How can we get this type of uh, um, concerns affect also the big economic interests of, of these nations? It, can, you, can you see a recipe there, or a hope at least? No, no <laughs> recipe, no recipe. Just hope and just the analysis of what is happening. It's, uh, uh, it's impossible for us in the Western world to say China, to, to talk with Chinese, Chinese people or Chinese scientists or in Brazil scientists or African scientists and say, now you have to stop your, your progress, your development, because now we understood in the Western part of the world that we, we have to be careful about that. It's impossible. It's, it's something, for example, in the, in the Sharm el Sheikh COP, the last COP in, in, in Sharm el Sheikh, Europe that we know is one of the part of the world in which we have regulations that are the most advanced in terms of environmental con protection. Uh, Europe is not seen from the global south as an example. They prefer to follow China and India. Uh, that, that and China and India now are the great nations that are following a very clear uh, strategic politics. We have carbon, we have fossil fuels, we use we will use them until we will be able to make our transition in the times that we decided according to china and india they will decide to have the transition from here to 260 but from here to 260 the degrees will be three degrees in average so we will be completely in a messy situation so that's the point and another in very important point that sometimes we discuss also in micro mega is the fact now with democracies are in in a trouble in facing with climatic uh, um, topic in 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 united states there is movement a provocative movement called the climate leviathan and according to these philosophers and scientists maybe only a leviathan so maybe just an authoritarian power will be able to impose the good decisions on climate. Of course, it's a paradox, but it's a provocation related to the fact that we have to use and to maintain freedom and democracy in the decision for the climate. So Europe, for me, it's a place in which we are debating exactly this point. Thank you. I think I, I go on a second subject, and you will see me jumping on different subjects, not, not because I cannot follow a line like in the because book. because this book is a is a collection of so many aspects and uh, uh, basically i think you can find any type of subject in that related to nature and human uh, nature and this is actually a bit more philosophic because in um, in another uh, chapter in the book or in another article um, you talk well you start and make me think we we use the word natural and normal in our in our language as synonyms. And, uh, and in fact, you say this is really not the case. Uh, you, there is a quote that I have here. It says, normality and nature do not get along with each other because the latter is the domain of possibility, not of necessity. And this is very profound, I think. Yeah, you have to explain this, to me, at least to me. Uh, um, but it made a connection in my mind with a, with a, with a book which is uh, Jacques Monod's uh, book of the chance and, possi chance and possibility and necessity. And sorry, chance and necessity uh, and uh, this book talked about the relationship between chance and necessity at uh, microscopic level basically at biological biomolecules uh, level um, are you making a relation to this, uh, to this type of consideration? Is this an expansion at macroscopic level sure. of the thoughts of Monod? Sure, absolutely. <coughs> uh, you have to reread Jacques Monod if you if you if you don't know. Chance and necessity is a masterpiece for a philosophy of nature, and Jacques Monod was a Nobel Prize for his discoveries of the regulation of the of the of the genes uh, together with François Jacob. And yes, it's a, it's something like a, a, a small uh, updating of Jacques Monod ideas for for two main reasons. The first one is that um, Jacques Monod in that book was great in explaining 
all our misunderstandings when we talk about nature. Because we love to think that nature, for example, is the domain of normality, is the domain of something that being natural has to be good, has to be ideal, has to be standard, because we think that nature is so old. We had millions of years of evolution, of change, of fine tuning. So we think, but it's completely wrong, that something natural has to be perfect, has to be optimized, has to be good. And natural has good, it's a, it's a very famous misunderstanding in philosophy. Charles Darwin was very aware about that. Darwin read David Hume, and, Dev and, and Darwin was the guy that, in a scientific terminology, was able to explain to us exactly the point. So nature is not something essential. It's impossible to find in nature kinds, ideal essences. So it's impossible to say that something is good being normal, because nature is the domain of diversity. And according to Darwin, and this is a very revolutionary idea, even today, according to Darwin, the fuel of any change in evolution is individual diversity, not the diversity of species, races, varieties, or something like that. Just the diversity of each individual. And why? Because according to Darwin, each individual is, is an integration of different varieties, of different diversities. Gender diversity, sexual diversities, history diversity, species diversity, environmental diversities, personal history diversity, and so on. So each individual is something unique, bearing differences. And every other evolutionary process depends on this variety, so this diversity. So natural selection, today we know genetic drift, uh, evolutionary, macroevolutionary processes, everything has at the base individual diversity. That's one of the most important points. The second one is that, according to Darwin, in nature you cannot find any mainstream, you cannot find any direction, and as Jacques Monod explained very well in, in Chance and Necessity, uh, we have to avoid any animistic approach to science, any finalistic approach to science. Darwin was very skeptical, for example, for, about the association between evolution and progress. And this is quite counterintuitive because Darwin uh, was in the, in the United Kingdom during the Victorian era, and everyone told about progress at that time. But Darwin said, I'm not sure that evolution is progress, because I see, I'm quoting Darwin, that the most successful organisms in nature are very simple organisms, like bacteria, or like unicellular uh, organisms. And we understood that this is very, this is absolutely true during the pandemic. Because during the pandemic, we, uh, in a tragic, dramatic way, we appreciated the fact that nature is bigger than us, just because, a, just a teeny uh, chain of RNA surrounded by by a pellicle of, of proteins, that, like it's a, it's a very simple organism, a very old organism. If you look at the beginning of life on Earth, this is exactly the organism that you find. So viruses, RNA viruses. So, and this very simple organism was able to completely destroy our life for two years. So Darwin was right exactly in this idea, this skepticism about progress. And then, what is the right way to think about nature? Nature is the domain of diversity, the domain of change. Diversity is a continuous change. And according to Darwin, but also to the contemporary natural sciences, when you study evolution, you always make a photo of a process. So you are just doing, uh, studying just a moment in a change situation. So it's a continuous change. And in this change, the philosophical category is the possibility, not necessity, because evolution is the exploration of the possible depending on the contingent environmental conditions. And this is what exactly Mono uh, wrote in, in this book. So evolution has chance, because you have mutations, you have environmental changes, you have contingencies, and necessity, 
that is the natural selection part of the story that is able to produce complexity, structure, order, but coming from the mutation, chance mutation. So this is the magic of evolution. Chance and necessity and exploration of possibility. And please also consider the c philosophical consequences of this approach to our lives. Because even today, I don't know in Germany, but in Italy it's very successful, this completely misleading argument according to which um, when you, in Italy, when you want to find something solid in order to uh, mm, reinforce your argument, you say, this is biological, this is natural, okay? This is completely, completely wrong because biology and nature is the domain of possibility, not the domain of necessity or the foundation of something. This is, this is important for me because as a biologist, as a philosopher of biology, I don't want that people use biology and nature in an ideological way. If you look at history, every authoritarian uh, people use nature and biology in order to try to explain the reason of something that was cultural, like patriarchate structure or inequalities. Every time they use nature and biology. So we have to be careful using these words. Well, this is really interesting. In fact, it goes into the language. Yeah? As you start saying, uh, natural and normal. Uh, it's, it's really the opposite. But and also, I have to say, uh, maybe, it, maybe you noted also <coughs> in Germany, uh, during the first stage, uh, the first phase of the pandemic, we have seen again the argument according to which the pandemic is a message from nature. Is nature that is saying to us that we are wrong, that we are arrogant, so it's a new breeze. And again, when we are in a problem, we think that nature is giving to us a message because we think that nature is a person is something with an intention, but nature is not, is not a person. Nature is a system of relationship in which to, to which we belong. But this is actually a nice uh, uh, bridge to my next question, because we're talking about evolution and nature, and uh, um, there is in a, in a later chapter when you talk about our fragility, you say fragility is our strength, and there is a nice quote that says, the, there was a point in the history of the human species in which biological evolution w was overtaken by cultural evolution. And uh, that's an interesting point. You, you can be maybe fragile as an individual, but if this fragility allows you to build a social structure, then maybe the social structure makes you strong. Yeah? Um, now, this is linked to, a, to, to, my question is, where is human evolution going because yeah the simple thought is well today natural selection is not acting on us anymore because yeah we have uh, weak people are cured by society are taken care of by society and uh, so uh, we are over darwin but in your book actually you you tackle many aspects of evolution which are still uh, working on the human species so in what sense uh, natural selection is still applicable to the current evolution of the human species and is there a evol evolution of the human species what what are the the mechanisms that drive it yeah that's a very huge <coughs> question um uh, i like to say that human human species as darwin said in a, in the descent of man um homo sapiens is a paradoxical species for many reasons one his reason is exactly what you were saying in the descent of man if you read darwin Darwin, in, a, in the, in the fi fifth chapter, uh, wrote, we are a very strange species because we are the outcome of natural selection and we are just a natural product of the natural history. Okay? This is my theory, Darwin is writing. But thanks to our brain, thanks to the evolution of our mind and imagination, according to Darwin, imagination was crucial for human evolution, we were able, we became able to produce behaviors like hygiene, medicine, welfare, that are counter-selective forces. So, why we are paradoxical? Because thanks to natural selection and, and natural history, we are able to uh, 
to diverge from the result of natural selection. And at the end, Darwin wrote, and this is good because medicine and welfare are the product of the most uh, uh, important and most ethical part of our nature. This is the conclusion by Darwin. That it's a paradoxical conclusion. And this is still true today. Um, we are a paradoxical species also because, as you said, we made our fragility as a strength, as, as our force. In for example, in human, in human body, in human nature, you can find many adaptations that for us, as evolutionists, are very strange because we, we are so creative and we are so successful in nature due to very costly adaptation. For example, human language is a very costly adaptation. Uh, the evolution of human brain is very costly in a metabolic sense and for many other reasons. We have a body that is a trade-off between many antagonistic forces. We are bipedal mammals, but with a structure of quadrupedal mammals. So we are so strange and we have uh, many, many compromises in our body. For example, the human delivery is completely nonsense. No other animal has such an inefficient and completely wrong way to deliver. But why? Because it's a, it's a compromise between bipedal evolution, the growth of human brain, the time of, of delivery, and so on. So it's, it's incredibly strange. Neoteny is another wonderful example. We are the only mammal species that decided in evolution to slow down the development. So we have a period of infancy and adolescence and teenager period that are longer and longer. This is no sense in evolution because any other mammal try to speed up development because they have to grow up and defend our offspring from, from predators. This is a very costly adaptation. We think this is what we call relaxed selection. So we humans, exactly as Darwin said, we are so successful because we were able to weaken up natural selection effects. And this is very important because, for example, thanks to neoteny, we had cultural evolution bec because we have brains with a longer period of playing, of uh, social imitation, of Lear for learning something, for learning social behavior and so on. So these costly adaptations add other benefits in other parts. So we are the result of continuous trade-off between different antagonistic forces. And I think this, is, this will be true also for the future. And you, you, you ask how will be future evolution for humans. It's, it's a very hard question for me. The two directions that we can see in our projections are the first one is that we are changing in a dramatic way environment, the environment. And in evolution, this means that m sooner or later, we will have different selective pressures acting on us. So, and we are beginning to see that, for example, in some changes in, in the brain plasticity in, in, in our child. For example, in the microbiota, we are seeing the first evolutionary changes. So in the most flexible part of our, of our nature. So what we expect for the future is this interesting but also dangerous situation. We change the world and then the next generation has to adapt to an environment that the previous generation has changed. This is what we expect for the future. And this could be very dangerous because, for example, the next generation could have most more costly adaptation exactly as we will happen in the next one, two, or three generations. They have to adapt to 1.5 degree on average in the climate change. N it never happened in our history. So please remind that our civilizations, based on writing, based on cities, our civilization in every continent, were based on a climate range 
as an average between 40 between 14 and 15 degrees okay so a very narrow range climate range and we adapted our civilizations to this very narrow range now we are moving this range from one degree and a half never happened in the history of civilization so it's something serious we have to think about that never happened and uh, it's something like a species that is changing the world in a very detrimental way for his future so it's 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 a paradox it's a sad paradox and the second way main way for future evolution is technologically made evolution because now we have gene editing for example gene editing is a new technology through which we are able to change dna with this copy and pass process and the dna of plants animals but also if we want so far we don't want uh, we can change the germ line for the first time in the history of life I a species us we are is able to change the germ line because we can change the embryonic cells so we can change we can put mutations that then enter the lineage in in the evolution so in the future if we want we can change directly evolution to technological interventions this is something completely new in evolution and now we have the technology for doing that so we have to think about that also because again as in any case in technology human technologies they can use they can be used in a very ambivalent way in a dual use so i can use gene editing for wonderful things in medicine but i can use gene editing for doing uh, mass destruction biological weapons or to change embryonic cells in a completely uncontrolled way i i want to go back to the, the other aspect of uh, evolution that you you mentioned so our necessary adaptation to the environment because you you quote um, uh, Richard Leakey where he says I'm worried that there are still people that preach a return to the primordial equilibrium with nature we can't go back to any equilibrium with nature the process is irreversible we are too many we want too much what we have to do is remember that we are part of nature not a separate entity now this is very interesting, a very hard statement, yeah? but it's, it's a very interesting, say, direction towards what our relationship with the environment should be. Uh, so, can we, you, you think we can really establish a better relationship with, uh, with nature and with the, with the environment? Is it possible or um, are we not actually doing the opposite, which is, okay, we change the environment because of our interests, we increase the temperature, and eventually this, this is a sort of road to self-destruction. Yeah. Le let me, before, let me, let me remind you who was Richard Leakey, because he passed away a year ago, and he was a wonderful scientist, and Richard Leakey was one of the most important paleontologists working in Africa, in Kenya, and, and in Tanzania. He was a discoverer of Omer Gaster and many other fossils for human species in the past, in the genus Homo. And, but he also was the chief of the wildlife conservation found in Kenya. And he was the guy that, that burned up all the avorium of the elephants in order to break down the illegal trade of, 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 of this material in Africa. He, he was victim of many, many attempts for his life and he survived and, and, and he was great. So please read the book of Richard Leakey because included, because he was the, I, I have to remind that because I, I, I like to remind the scientists that for the first time said something completely isolated. Richard Leakey together with Edward Wilson, they were the two guys that for the first time wrote about what we call today the sixth mass extinction. Uh, 30 years ago, they wrote books explained that according to their calculation, their statistics, the decrease of diversity ongoing was equivalent with respect to the great mass extinction of the past, that were five mass extinction. So they thought about the six mass extinction. For 20 years, the other, the scientific community thought that they were just apocalyptic, just a catastrophic 
guys, today we confirmed and nature and science confirmed that the, uh, ac the current degree of, of destruction of biodiversity is equivalent to the previous five mass extinctions. So uh, Richard Leakey was a great, great, great scientist and a great man. And in, in this quotation, he is great because he is saying something very profound is we cannot come back to an, something like an original nature. And this is another misunderstanding that, that frequently we, we have about nature. So the idea that in the past we had a golden age with equilibrium and harmony with nature, for example, native people, native community in, a, in harmony with, with, with environment, and then with the civilization like in Rousseau, and then in civilization, we had the destruction of the Golden Age. This is not true, according to scientific evidence. For example, uh, in the past year in, in nature, no, in science, in science, they, uh, a, a team of wonderful, great uh, ecologists published a, a paper explaining that since the beginning of the Neolithic transition, so 12 millennia ago, more or less, at least 80% of the surface of the earth was already inhabited, was already occupied by humans. And the second point, very important, still today, the regions in which you have the highest level of biodiversity are not region of a pristine nature without humans. They are regions in which humans were able to co-evolve in a good way in a slow and sustainable way with nature. So this is a very important point. There's no necessary dichotomy between humans and nature. We have examples of the possibility that a good coevolution between humans and environment could be very positive, even for biodiversity. For example, in Italy, we see a process of, we in, in Italy, mountains for decades have been abandoned by people. And you can think, okay, this is good for biodiversity because mountains are free for humans, so you, you should observe an increase of biodiversity. Absolutely not. You see a decrease of biodiversity. How is it possible? Without humans, a decrease in biodiversity. Yes, because humans in mountains were ecosystem engineering, so they were able to uh, divide in a mosaic of ecosystems the mountains and when you have more ecosystems you have more biodiversity without humans less biodiversity so it's an example of the fact that humans can be positive for biodiversity in such way so this is for me the meaning also in order to think about environmentalism okay that that, that many many for many aspects environmentalism in italy but also in europe was related to this dichotomic approach to the relationship between men, uh, between humans and environments. So, and no, no nostalgia of, 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 any net, of any past nature. We have to think about the future and we have to think about possible positive relationship between humans and nature. And this is the, what Leakey was saying. But also, let me say that in this quotation, I decided to use this quotation because Leakey was also talking about what is a taboo in the debate today? This is the dem demographic growth, okay? Think about the main causes of the destruction of the environment is pollution, climate change, deforestation, um, um, exploitation of resources, hunting and fishing and so on, illegal hunting and fishing. Quite never people talk about demographic growth. That is one of the main cause of the impact of humans on earth. It's a taboo argument, according to my colleague, demographic, demographist colleagues. By the way, in the book, the chapter where you talk about Richard Leakey is quite long. You talk really extensively about this person. We can see that you admire very much this person. And, and it's a remarkable uh, story, so I think it's definitely worth reading. Like you have remarkable stories about animals, like, uh, you know, um, the, the whales, Capodoglio, I don't know how to translate that in... in Stem uh, whales. Right. And uh, uh, there, there are incredible animals that, that actually um, uh, show how diversity is really the, the fundamental aspect of nature. 
Um, but I want to, to spend the last uh, two questions on the final part of your book where you talk about uh, uh, communicating science, which I found really fascinating. It's a set of lessons learned from the uh, science communication, but also science perception during the pandemics. That's the way at least I read it. And it's actually um, a set of lessons learned in the negative science, and so mistakes that we should avoid repeating. But reverting the, the lesson, I, I start with something that, uh, with a quote of Richard Feynman, which is my favorite physicist, um, where he, say, he says, uh, when someone says science teaches such and such, he's using the word incorrectly. Science doesn't teach it, experience teaches it. If they tell you that science has demonstrated a certain thing, you could ask, how did it demonstrate it? In what uh, has the scientist, what has discovered, uh, what has the scientist discovered and how? How, where, when? It was not science, it was the experiment. It was the ex phenomenon. Uh, I think you summarize this in a, in a sentence. You say, do not just communicate the results, explain how they were achieved. And, uh, uh, or there is a title, not only products, but, but processes. Um, now, this is, for me, the basic lesson that you have uh, in this decalogue of these 10, ten uh, mistakes that should not be repeated. But my question to you is, uh, do you think we have learned the lesson? And when I say we, I mean the scientists in communicating, but also the public in say, interpreting or giving the right weight to what the scientists say. Yeah, I, I decided to include this, the Decalogue with 10 principles that I published in Micromega before, um, because I'm, I was and I'm quite completely unsatisfied about the science communication mood that we had during the pandemic and even after the pandemic. I don't know if we, uh, we, we learned the lesson, has Jacques Monod in, in, in Chance and Necessity and in many papers wrote, and I completely agree with him, Monod said, and I, I thought a lot about that during the pandemic, Monod said mm, many people and frequently people and the, the general audience, the public audience, tend to have something like a utilitaristic approach to science. They think that science is, is important just when they need it. I think it's right, because in politicians, but also citizens, um, and a part of the public opinion thinks about science just when you have a problem, and you call science, call you as a scientist to, to, to find solutions. And this is the wrong way to think about science, because science is knowledge, science is methods, is an approach to reality, is empirism and rationality, skeptical doubt, it's a research and has, in, in this wonderful quotation by Feynman, is a matter of is something like a continuous challenge with what you don't know. So with ignorance. As Karl Popper said, ignorance usually in our daily life is something negative because it's something that we don't know. And there, there, there is a bad way to think about ignorance, for example, in the web. So According to Popper, who is a very ignorant person? The person that thinks to know, okay? The people with many certainties, they are the ignorant, according to Popper, and I agree with him. But Popper said, in science, there is a good version of ignorance. The good version of ignorance is the fact that you understand that you don't know, so you continue to search and to put questions and to have another question after the answer that you had, and again, again, new question and new question. This is the good way to think about ignorance. And ignorance in science had also two versions that are very interesting. When, and you are an example of, of course in your career, when you, you know that you don't know something, for example in my field we know that we don't know about many species that we have in the world. For example, According to a recent paper, it's incredible, so far we classified just the 10% of the species living on the oceans. 
10%. So we are very ignorant. We don't know that 90% of species living in the ocean. But we know that. So in this case, we know that we don't know. What is wonderful in science is another kind of ignorance that is when you understand that before you didn't know that you don't know. So when you have a new discovery that is so strong that you understand that before you had no the imagination about what you discovered. And that is a serendipitous part of science. So when you discover something completely unexpected that you were not looking for. So Feynman was absolutely right. And why I'm, I'm, I'm completely unsatisfied? Because during the pandemic, many colleagues of ours, of us, say, say in presented science has uh, something about certainties, about predictions. How many times watching the TV, I, I, I was listening to guys talking about, for example, something that I know very well, for example, the evolution, okay? Because pandemic is, is an evolutionary process. So it's a red queen process of coevolution between hosts and pathogens, so we study these models. And I remember the question from the journalist and then the scientist in the TV and I was thinking, please, say three very simple words. I don't know. Please, answer, I don't know. And never happened, never happened. Nev no one said, I don't know, no one. Every, every scientist trying to, to, to put hypotheses and, and c in a confusing way. And, and two weeks ago, I told with a, a very important Italian epidemiologist working in the Imperial College, Paolo Vines, and uh, it was very funny because Paolo uh, told me that in the first months of the pandemic, um, some journalists tried to, to find Paolo in the Imperial College trying and, and um, asking him for the pandemic. And first time he answered it to a question about the prediction about the, um, the trend of the pandemic in the next season, and Paolo answered, I don't know. We don't know. It's impossible to know that. The second time he answered, we don't know. It's impossible to know that. The third times, after the third times, no other journalist called him. <laughs> Never. And we don't know absolutely the, the, the fact that the most important expert in epidemiology was Paolo Vines. Do you know Paolo Vines in Italy? No one knows Paolo Vines. Why? Because he answered in the right way. We don't know. And journalists completely disappeared. So it's great. It's, that's the point. So, and so ignorance, okay, so that technically speaking means you ha when you explain science, you have to explain the degree of uncertainty, okay, of your hypothesis, and you have to explain how you, you build hypotheses and you compare different hypotheses. So you have to explain the process, the methodology. You have to explain the evidence that you have, the data that you are sharing with others. You have to explain methodology. Because in the same time, you can explain the process of science, but also the product. There's a great experiment, um, not in the pandemic, before the pandemic, in nature. Um, it's a statistical experiment um, made in didactical situation. If you explain to people science without the methodology, with respect to explain the same concept with the history of the concept, the methodology and the process in order, thanks to which scientists were able to reach the concept, and then you compare the result, the people to which you explain science using methodology are much more prepared with respect to the other. So it's an experiment showing exactly this point. Science, you, in order to communicate and explain science, you have to explain science as a process rather than just a product. And another very important point, two, points that very unsatisfaction for me. One, when you talk about science, you have to explain that you, when you are talking by yourself and when you are talking in the name of the scientific community. Are two different situations, completely different situations. I had fight with scientists because they were talking for themselves, but saying, you have to listen to me because I'm talking in the name of scientific community. But 
who are you? Who are you? Why you are the representative of something? And the difference is when you have, mostly when you, we are in an emergent situation, we have to distinguish people that, is, that are talking in, in a personal way and scientists that are representative of a community, okay? Or representative of an institution. It's different, okay? And this is a, a lesson that in Italy maybe more or less we learned. Now we have the representatives of the inst scientific institution. Before the pandemic, it was absolutely absent this point. And another one that is important for me is, and in this case I know that many scientists did that disagree with me, but I'm, I'm convinced about that. When you uh, try to explain the scientific methods and the scientific process, you have to do that in the right um, institutional situation. For example, a scientific debate needs rules, places, needs time, needs uh, a specific situation. So congresses, conferences, scientific journals, uh, even social blogs among scientists, okay, but it needs specific places. I think that it's incompatible to explain or to show a scientific debate in TV, in a talk show in TV, or in Twitter or in a social network. Because in a, talk, in a TV talk or in a social network, the rules of the communication are completely different. It, they are the polarization of the positions, the radicalization of the contrast, the simplification of the position that are incompatible with any scientific debate. So I proposed in Italy when a scientist is invited to a talk show and he knows or she knows that the director of the show invited also the other scientists that you know is in contrast with you, you have to immediately understand that you have not to come. Okay? You have not to come. You have to renounce to your narcissism and you have not to accept because you are accepting the rules of another game that is not science, is TV talk show. Legitimate, but it's completely different with science. But many of my colleagues disagree because they say, no, I come, I come because even in this strange situation, I will explain my position and I will popularize uh, science. No, you are not popularizing science. You are participating to a show as an actor of the show and the rule of the show are decided by others, not by you. That's my point. I think in your answer you revealed at least two, of, uh, two additional rules of your uh, list of ten mistakes not to make. Yeah? And I wanted to keep them secret, otherwise the people don't buy the book. Yeah? So I, uh, but anyway, uh, it's just to, to show that uh, there, there's a lot of, uh, uh, well, many lessons learned in a, in a in a moment where, as you say, actually science became public, yeah? And then there were many mistakes made. Having said that, uh, the problem is that if you behave correctly and you follow these rules, it may, may end up that uh, what is actually um, communicated is only by those that are not following the rules. So you don't go to the, to the talk show, somebody else will go and that will be passed as science. Uh, or you say, I don't know, three times, and the third time, nobody asks you the question. They will ask us. So we have to educate also the people, not only the scientists. Yeah? So these sure. rules are good for the scientists? Sure, absolutely. That's the, the <coughs> you are right. For example, there, there is a debate now in Italy because, uh, unfortunately, even in the public service, um, there are TV talk show uh, inviting people that deny the climate change as an anthropic process. So in this case, climate people working on climate change has they have to come or not to this to these debates. If you come, the problem is what I explained before. If you don't come, you have the problem that Paolo is saying. Another solution was past week, completely terrible because one of my colleagues, after a long discussion that we have, decided to come. But he decided to ask the rule 
according to him that according to him was right. So he he said, I come to the discussion, but you, director of the show, you interviewed me alone, not with a debate with a Danielist, because I want to explain my position not with the argument of something that is denying science, I have to explain, and you have to give me 10 minutes, at least 10 minutes, to explain my reasons. And the director said, okay, you can come and I will interview you 10 minutes and you will have time to present your ideas. And he, he came. Then we watched the, trans the transmission, the TV talk show, and, and the, the situation was the scientist, one of the most important scientists on climate change in Italy, Okay, an interview in 10 minutes. After these 10 minutes, 20 minutes of Danielist destroying his position without the possibility to him to answer because it was registered before. So 10 minutes and then 20 minutes because the director said have to respect the peer, peer position, the, peer, the, peer, um, the, the, the same time of the two positions. So it's paradoxical. In, I'm trying to, to, to propose in Italy that in this case the problem is the director of the show, the problem is the author of the show, and we have to propose a list of journalists that are doing this in order to lower the reputation of this journalist. Okay, this is the blacklist of the journalists that according to, to our rules are, are denying a, a right debate about science because reputation like money in Italy is very valued so we can use reputation maybe okay um, I think I have a few minutes for a last question which I, I like to finish with this because it sounds a bit provocative it's on philosophy of science I wanted to hear your opinion and again I quote Richard Feynman because as I said he's my favorite scientist or s physicist and he said the philosophy of science is as useful to scientists as ornithology is to birds. And uh, I found this very funny. And since I, I consider Feynman a very, well, a brilliant mind, he must have some right. Yeah? But I wanted to hear your opinion about, uh, about that. Because in a way, all this talk about behavior of scientists could be also be put into a philosophical sort of uh, uh, guidelines. Yeah? But, uh, just to finish the conversation. Sure. Maybe I could surprise you because I, I quite agree with Feynman for, for some reason. Because Feynman, <laughs> it's a very famous quotation by Feynman in, in my field. Because at that time, Feynman had a polemic uh, uh, target, that, and I, I agree with him because it, it was the, the so called general philosophy of science. So it's, it, it was at that time a very theoretical and abstract way to think about the philosophy of science. So something like philosophers that, that even today talk about science and they don't know what science is. So Feynman was right in this sense. But I have to say that Feynman is not so right today if we, can, if, if we use this quotation today for two reasons. One is serious, is that today philosophy of science evolved and changed completely. Today we don't no longer we have in, in Italian department, the European department, general philosophy of science. Today, a philosopher of science has a scientific training and then a theoretical training on the discipline. And like in my case, I work in the department of biology, not in the department of philosophy. I work and I publish in science, in scientific journal. I have a group of people working with me that mostly are not philosophers, but scientists. So molecular anthropologists, biologists, and so on. So why I'm also a philosopher? Because I think that philosophy could be very useful mostly in interdisciplinary fields like my field, human evolution. Because, for example, mm, philosophers can have, philosophers of science in this sense, with a scientific training, can be more able to put together different data from coming from different languages and different disciplines, like genetics, paleontology, archaeology, even linguistics, or paleoclimatology, and so on. Uh, it's funny, but when we write papers in my group, one of my job is to is the what we call the rhetoric of the paper. So writing the paper in a way through which can be less uh, vulnerable 
to the to reviewers and when the reviewers put the criticisms i'm the guy that answer because i know the rhetoric i know the way to answer in the right way and i know the way to change the minimum the paper in order to answer the criticism of the of the reviewers so i'm i'm in the charge with this but also uh, we were talking before about gene editing ethical reasoning about technology need needs philosophers because we have a training um, in order to discuss about philosophical and ethical categories surrounding science so and also science communication because if you need when you communicate science if you if you have to explain scientific method philosophy of science has a specialization in scientific methodology and what is a pt in in italy i don't know in other in other countries we don't have in the scientific curriculum for example in biology or in physics we don't have nothing about scientific methods okay how to write papers how to defend your ideas we have a great problem in italy we are forming people all quite always with written examination and they arrive in the final dissertation with their slides and commission scientific commission tend to criticize something and you see these young young students completely unable to answer criticism you have to be smart you have to ex to answer you have to to understand the rhetoric of science you have to defend your idea so you need argumentation and philosophy of science is exactly related to argumentation for example my examination are always oral examinations because i want that students defend their ideas and when they defend their ideas i immediately put myself in the opposite position i criticize them and they have to defend your ideas against my ideas and this is very useful because in science when you come to a congress when you come to to a meeting you have to defend your ideas so these are just examples of of why philosophy of science could be useful and anyway Feynman was wrong in the sense that ornithologist doing the fact that birds are threatened of extinction ornithology can classify birds so ornithologists can be very useful for birds but but in fact it's it's what you say it's probably the difference between uh, the philosopher of science who talks about something that he's never did and he never understood and he's not working with a scientist you're talking a philosopher of science that actually in an interdisciplinary way works in a team of scientists or help the scientists. So the same is for the ornithologists. They just talk about birds or those that want to help them. But I, I just stop, stop here. Uh, first of all, thank again, uh, Telmo, for, for this. I, I could go on forever, yeah? uh, but uh, I think it's your opportunity to, to, spend, uh, to, to have questions to Professor Pievani. Uh, there is a microphone. Don't be shy. Yeah? Okay, very good. Yeah. Thanks a lot for, <clears throat> for this amazing uh, presentation, lecture was very inspiring. I didn't want to make the first question, but since nobody was doing it, I just take the chance. Um, I'll do first the question, I just throw it there, and then I'll do some comments uh, in order to maybe just you know, allow you to have some, because it's a very general question. Like, the question is like, I was for some time very interested what could be the, the, the um, uh, for an uh, evolutionary bio biologist, uh, as I understand is your main topic, uh, like the idea behind the, our cognition of causality. It's, it is something that it's uh, for me very fascinating because I, um, um, yeah, as an architect, I'm always questioning things, you know, that, uh, the way they should be done and, and things so on. But I was reading this book about, uh, from uh, uh, Timothy Morton, it's like a philosophy about dark ecology, and I found very fascinating the fact that you're saying causality is in front of things instead of behind things. And for this reason also, you know, just like, it also connects a lot to the things you were discussing about the chance, chance and possibility, about ignorance, 
uh, about also uh, sustainability, like uh, environmental crisis more than sustainability. It's, it's the question is like, is there something in, in our biologic system <laughs> that it's not allowing us to proceed? You know, it's like, it's just like, it, is there something also, you know, this contrary to idea of uh, nature that it's not really progressing? And we, you know, when we say Darwinistic theory, we always say evolutionary, like if there is an evolution. And, you know, just like, yeah, it's just like, I'm throwing it there. I, like, I hope I'm not uh, expanding too much the conversation. That's a very complex question, very good question. Uh, let me say before that we are exactly writing a book about evolution and architecture uh, in the United States by Rutledge with, with the New York Institute of Technology. So maybe you could be interested in exactly at trying to apply uh, evolutionary um, metaphors and concepts like functional shift uh, or niche construction to architecture. It's a, it's a very interesting field of connection. About causality, you are right. I think that the point is that some philosophers, some in people th think that we have to rethink our ways to connect to nature. And Tim Morton has a radical uh, idea that we have to think about causality in a completely not rational way, so not in the sense of, of, of a rational and um, uh, in a distancing way with nature. We have to, to, to feel ourselves immersed in a network of causes and effects with nature. And I quite agree with him. It, it, he was great when he proposed to us, and today we use every day, this idea that climate change is an hyper object. So it's something so complex, so uh, with so multiple causes, so non-linear in his its manifestations that it's quite impossible for our rational mind to grasp all all the all the thing the hyper object and i think he is right climate change is very counterintuitive for us for our mind it's not a justification it's just a way to understand why it's so difficult for us why it was so difficult for us to understand that we we had a problem because climate change is very counterintuitive. We can have a May or a June uh, humid and, and cold is due to climate warming. It's counterintuitive, but you can explain it by scientific modeling, but it's not so easy. So he's right. Uh, Amitav Ghosh, the Indian writer, in his uh, a book uh, about, about the history of colonialism and, and environmentalism, propose a very radical, another very radical idea, according to Amitav Ghosh, in order to regain our connection to nature, we should rediscover animism. Because according to Amitav Ghosh, only animism will be able to, uh, to, to save us. It's a very radical idea, but very interesting from his point of view. And he said, ra the Western idea of science was a, one, or was a piece of the problem uh, also rather than a piece of the solution. So this is the debate that we have today. I think this something I is good. I'm, I'm, I come from a different background with respect to Tim Morton and Amitav Ghosh. I think that we have to, we can rationalize our, uh, what is happening and even our relation with nature. For example, using scientific evidence. My examples, for example, the idea that the connection between humans and nature was very, very uh, old and is possible a positive connection uh, are al always based on scientific evidence. I think that now the most radical material that we can use in order to understand what we have to change our behavior with respect to nature is science. And I, I feel that we have to listen to science and as exactly as Greta Thunberg and the young movement are saying. So I completely agree with him. But anyway, Tim Morton is right when he said that what is happening is counterintuitive for us. Okay, hi. Thank you so much for the talk. It was <coughs> very interesting, actually very inspiring. 
Um, so you talked a lot about science communication, and for me, as a scientist, the first thing that comes in my mind is about the source. Because I think this is one of the main problems. Like, um, with the pandemic, we saw what maybe the best example. So many people were talking about that, were giving answer, while most of the time, as you say, the answer is, we don't know. Um, but without really citing the source. For instance, I was talking with friends, with relatives, and they were like, oh, where did you find this information? I was this TV show, it was Google here and that. But you mentioned like journals, and you mentioned also very high impact one, like nature, like science. So my question is like, okay, what, first what's your opinion about, about the search, and how can we really push the, the people to, and sometimes even scientists, to really find the right source and to really look for them? Yeah, thank you. You, you, are, you are absolutely right. This is the problem behind the Decalogue that I, that I wrote, absolutely behind. But it's, it's the most profound problem. I think that we can solve it just by education. So it will be a slow process. We have to educate to sources in the schools. In Italy, for example, during the pandemic, now we have the data. More than 75% of people had as, it, as their official sources TV, and social networks, 75%, okay? So, so we have a problem. So we have to explain what is a source, and it's important also that the source is able to present itself in a very friendly, in a very participating, and engaging way. But now, ne now we have sources with these capabilities. Now we have blogs uh, in nature and science, we have podcasts, we have new languages, we have new projects of science communication. So we are doing a lot in science communication in a very innovative way. But we have to reach this part of the audience. For example, in Italy, we have many great projects of science communication. But if you look at the statistics, but because even in science communication we need data, we need scientific evidence. If you look at the statistics, we are, continu we, we are continuing to talk about the same 800,000 people. So less than 3% of the population in Italy that are the same people that you can find uh, in the libraries, that you can find the science festival, that you can find in the, all the situation in which you explain science. And all the other ones, they watch TV and they are on the social web, in the social network. So. And, and many scientists stop here and say, okay, it's a problem of the audience. No, in my case, it's a problem for us to try to find new projects able to reach the other part of the population. For example, with project with TV or project with social web or with new languages and, and so on and so on. And we have many possibilities. So we have to democratize science but we have to start with evidence and exactly working on sources and explain people the great difference between an institutional sources and an informal source. Absolutely, you are right. In Italy, now they are coming, they are beginning to, to prepare, I'm participating to some of this project, in schools, education to sources. So education to navigate, to browse in the, in the web and, and, and try to to understand the difference, okay, between, for example, an advertising and a scientific or fake news. We have many projects for fake news. And even in the case of fake news, let me say, philosophy of science is important because in, even in the case of fake news, we have data ex showing that if you have a fake news, you know, fake news are very well constructed, are very well built, okay? Fake news usually, uh, try to reach you thanks to your cognitive biases. So they are very persuasive, okay? They are very well done, okay? And mainly, and mostly, frequently, behind fake news, you can find very ec great expert in communication, unfortunately, okay? So don't think that fake news are just informal, because fake news are a business, okay? It's a virus, uh, they are viruses in the web, okay? So great business behind. In the case of fake news, if you limit yourself to respond case by case, fake by fake, 
you can have 20% of, of success because the other 80% of people will be even more polarized in, the pop in, the, in, the, in, in, in their position. But if you, we have experiment about that, if you respond and you refute and you falsify the fake news, but at the same time you explain to people the mechanisms of the fake news, the methodology of the fake news, the tricks that they use in order to confuse, you have much more success because people have an antidote in order to understand what is a fake news. So in not the debunking is not enough. You have to explain the mechanism. So again, you have to explain processes of knowledge. You have to explain cognitive biases at the school. You have to explain the schools that our mind has limitations, has biases. Everyone has biases. Even scientists have biases. They have bias of confirmation. They have narrative biases. Even scientists have biases. And fake news use our biases. So this is the education that we need for me. One last question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's a very good question. Just a precision, we did it, unfortunately. We are not sure, but we have many reasons to think that in China, uh, uh, a couple of twins they, they, they has been modified genetically before birth in, in embryos. Uh, the researchers that did it has been incarcerated, uh, is in jail for three years in, in China and has been banned by the scientific community. And But we can do it now, okay? In UK, they decided to permit just experimentation, so without any, any, any baby um, arriving, but experimentation with human embryos with gene editing. And what is the paradox? That, for example, in UK, is the only nation in where it's possible now. In all the other nations, it's absolutely prohibited with very problem if you try to do it. Um, in UK, using gene editing on human embryos not that where that it's impossible to implant okay for example human embryos with uh, karyotype with uh, variation in the karyotype so it's impossible to implant them we are discovering something very very important about development of embryos we are discovering very very important things about uh, diseases and people think that in this case it can be ethically um, um, legitimate to use gene editing even in human embryos, for example, for future possible um, therapies in embryos for dystrophies uh, or for Huntington chorea or Huntington disease or diseases for, for, for which we have a genetic pathway that is very clear. Okay? Because the problem of gene editing in humans, in human cells, is that you can put, in, you can copy and paste the sequence, but you can have what we call the off-target mutations, and this is due to ignorance because we don't we don't know a lot of things about the networks in, in, in of the genome. So you change a piece of the of the system, and you can have possible off-target mutations. So this is the, the technical problem that we have. So. According to the international panel that is working for the international organization about that, they say, okay, if nations, if some nation decide to permit just experimentations, not with implantation of embryos for um, reason of research, can be good, okay, and absolutely is good for somatic cells, for example. So you can use gene editing 
even so far, even now, for modifying the genetics of somatic cells, for example, for therapies against cancers, again, uh, uh, against many, many diseases, so it's very promising. So again, it's something new, and the ethical debate has to be very rational. You have to understand case by case, because it's not something good or wrong. It depends of the, of the, on the use that you, 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 you decide, but always with ambivalence. Let me just, another example, we said, okay, if you use genetic for somatic cells, it's not a problem. So no ethical discussion about that. Because we are trying to modify something that is not inheritable, so it's just a medical intervention on your body, so it's no ethical problem. But the devil is in the detail. Because this technique made possible what was absolutely non-imaginable since 10 years ago. What we call today genetic doping. Because with gene editing, I can reinforce my muscles. And so now we know the first examples of, 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 of sportsmen that used gene editing in order to have doping for their performance in different sports. So a new problems arise. And, and we have to, to try new solutions. And it's very hard because genetic doping is not traceable. You can, it's very, very hard to find the traces of the intervention because they are so precise that through gene editing you can simulate natural mutation that some individuals can have. For example, you know that some individuals can have blood with more hemoglobin, so but, but it's a natural mutation. You have great sportsmen, great champions, exactly due to natural mutation. This is not doping, it's just human diversity. But now we can simulate natural mutation. So the last proposal by the international organization working on ethical issues about biotechnology that is quite crazy for me, is that maybe in the future when we are very young and we start a sport in the school, we have to do a genetic mapping of our students. So you have the genetic mapping at the beginning of the career, and then you can check if in the future you have a mutation that were not present in the beginning. So it's something absolutely inimaginable in, in, in the past. And now we have these problems for the future. So thank, that's quite, quite frightening. But I think, yes, we... We are coming to the end. I want to thank again very much uh, Telmo Pievani for this incredible talk. Thank you. So I, I remind you that uh, you can uh, uh, purchase copies of the book. I think Professor Pievani will be happy to sign them if you want. But before we finish, I have uh, Dr. Santoriello.